Hi, this is Charlie McCoy from Nashville, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Okay, uh, well, I'll, I'll try not to um, test your memory too much, but we'll see how we go. Well, uh, you know, for an old guy, I've got a pretty good memory. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I um I noticed on your website you have uh, thirty five solo records to your name now, and I guess that would surprise a lot of people who uh, know you primarily for your for your session work. At any stage of your career, have you been torn between choosing one direction or, or the other for your career? Uh, not at all. I mean, actually, I came to Nashville, <laughs> auditioned as a singer, was turned down, but I was invited to a session. And I went to a session. I watched Brenda Lee record her first hit record. And when I saw that session, my whole life changed. I said, to heck with singing. I want to do this. <laughs> and so I came back to Nashville a year later. And a year after that, it was magic. I was recording. You know, I was a session player. I never really thought that much anymore about being an artist because all I wanted to do was play on sessions. But people kept coming to me. Hey, why don't you make some records, you know? And so uh, I started making records, and in 1971, I had a big hit, and there you go, you know. So I was kind of, you know, you get into that, and then you feel like, okay, well, let's see if we can keep it up. But I I never did it at the expense of my studio work, because I've always considered that the number one thing. As a young boy growing up, was, was the harmonica your, your first instrument of choice? It, it was my first instrument. I started when I was eight years old. Uh, but I also, shortly after, while I was still eight, I got a guitar. And uh, through my early years before teenage and into teenage, I was more into the guitar. But when I was 16, I heard a record by Jimmy Reed, and uh, I realized, hey, that, that sound is a harmonica. And I have one of those. I need to figure out how to do that. So I, I was completely uh, fired up about the harmonica again. So do you remember your first professional uh, session job? My first session? Yeah. Absolutely. My first session was with a young Swedish girl named Ann Margaret. Ah. Yeah. She was 18, and uh, she'd come to this country, and they decided that... Uh, you know, she wanted to be an actress all along, but they decided perhaps uh, as a singer that might open the doors quicker. So she came to Nashville and did a record, and I had played on the demo of this record. So uh, fortunately, I already knew what to do because uh, Chet Atkins was the producer, and he told the publisher that owned the song, whoever played this harmonica, I want him, and I want him to play exactly what he played on this demo. Uh, how competitive was it in, in Nashville amongst uh, the session players at that point when you, when you were first starting out? Was it a, a hard scene to break into? Well, there were no other harmonica players, and that, that worked in my favor. That was good, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the second session I did was actually the same week as the Ann Margaret session was Candyman by Roy Orbison which was a huge hit and that you know once that record hit the radio and it hit the charts my phone started to ring you know and it was like a it was like a, a dream come true so you consider that the session that that really made your name yeah yeah, yeah. well i got it was uh, the bass player on the ann margaret session was bob moore and uh, he was the leader of the roy orbison and i guess what I did on that Ann Margaret impressed him enough to come over and ask me if I wanted to work the, the Roy Orbison session later in the week. And, of course, I, I was a huge fan of Roy Orbison. You know, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so cool, <laughs> you know, to do a, two sessions in a week. I mean, uh, at, at, uh, an unknown kid, and, you know, 20 years old, it's, it's amazing. I think I read somewhere at at one point in those early years you left for Miami with with plans of becoming a teacher. Is that is that right? Well, actually, after I did my audition up here and I was turned down, I went back to Florida and started to University of Miami, and my major was music education. But 
less than a year I lasted because I realized pretty soon that I didn't want to teach music, I wanted to play music. And the memories of what I had seen and heard in Nashville kept, you know, they kept visiting me in my <laughs> in my sleep and while I was awake, and I thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm this is the wrong thing. And finally, before the first year was over, I just, uh, I said, this is definitely the wrong thing. I've got to go back to Nashville. Yeah. In all the years of session work you've done, did you, do you feel you developed an ear for knowing which particular songs you were working on had that little bit extra that, that, that made them potential hits? Could you? Well, you... I'd, I'd like to think I contributed as much as everyone else, you know, uh, uh, some records that are some of my favorites that I played on were like He Stopped Loving Her Today by George Jones. There was a record by Tom T. Hall called Old Dogs, Children, and Watermelon Wine. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people are, a lot of people have uh, freaked out over the, my guitar playing on Desolation Row. Oh, yes. Although I personally <laughs> thought it was a, it was a bad Grady Martin copy, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it it led to it led to Dylan coming to Nashville, uh, doing Blonde on Blonde, John Wesley Harding, and Nashville Skyline, which were three of the biggest records of his career. That's correct. And you, you recorded with with Bob Dylan both before and after his motorcycle accident. Did you sense a change in him and, and the way he approached his work? Not really. No. It was he was always the same to me. You know, he had very little to say. I would ask him what he if what he would think. You know, I was session leader, so I'm the uh, I'm the communication between him, the producer, and the musicians. And uh, so, you know, I would ask him what he thought, and he was his same. His answer was always, "I don't know. What do you think?" <laughs> so I finally quit asking. I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to do what I think is right, and if maybe if it, if it's not up to his taste, maybe he'll tell me. Well, he never did tell me, so I guess it was okay. <laughs> Talk about the Blonde on Blonde sessions. Le- legends have it that the studio musicians spent a lot of time during those sessions just waiting around while Bob wrote the songs. Is that pretty much how it was? It was uh, the, the first day. We were booked at 2 p.m. Uh, Dylan was coming from New York on a flight, which was late. He didn't show up till 6. He told us that he hadn't finished writing the first song for us to just, you know, be calm and wait around, and uh, so we started recording at 4 a.m. the next morning, and it was the song called "Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands," which, which was a, <laughs> a 14, 14 minute song. Yeah, that's kind of that's hard to keep your concentration <laughs> when you've been up that long. But then after that, it went much more, uh, much much smoother than that. Yeah, yeah. Can you recall any particular sessions you played on where, where you were sure you were playing on a on a song that was going to be a major hit and it, it just didn't happen? Uh, uh there was a it was a, a a Joe South session. Are, are you familiar with Joe South? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, okay. There was a Joe South session. He did a song called Concrete Jungle, which I just knew was going to be a hit, and they they never even released it. Oh. Uh, but I've been on some that I just had that feeling. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, all the musicians in the studio would get that feeling all at once, you know, and, and everybody's looking around at each other like, hey, we're on to something here, you know. Yeah. I had that feeling on uh, He Stopped Loving Her Today. I had it on Pretty Woman. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, I had it, uh, I did a, a record with Gordon Lightfoot called the Canadian Railroad Trilogy. I, oh, I yes. had it on that song. I had it on The Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, th- there's been times when I definitely had that feeling. Absolutely. But the Simon and Garfunkel sessions, the legends have it, there was a lot of um, disharmony between the duo at that particular time. Did you witness any of that in the studio? Well, I just, uh, what I saw was that uh, from a creative standpoint, Simon was completely in charge, and uh, you know uh, Garfunkel would make a suggestion or two here and there, and uh, there was kind of a s- standard answer: "No, Artie, that won't work." 
That was kind of the standard answer. Hey, and when you look at his track record, who's to say he was wrong? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> was there a real sense of community amongst the, the session guys in Nashville in those days, more so than now? Absolutely. It, hey, it's still there today, believe me. Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, I am so, you know, I'm so proud to be involved in a in a business where excellence is the average I mean these people I mean of course I, I was lucky I came in with the old A team and these guys they set the bar so high for anyone who followed them you know yeah as far as their dedication to the music and to the artists and and I mean those guys were they were on all the time they and they cared so much about what they did and fortunately this has passed along because uh, you know I I don't do many mainstream sessions anymore, but I know the musicians that are all doing the mainstream, and I know they all have that same commitment to excellence that uh, that the old guys did. Of course, nowadays, you know, with the technology, you can uh, you can make it exactly the way you wanted it to be, you know, and uh, which is contrast a record like El Paso, Grady Martin playing guitar, uh, you know. Uh, it was a live cut, no overdubs, no nothing like that. It was done live on a barred guitar, and it's one of the greatest pieces of session work I've ever heard. Mm. Now, aside from harmonica, guitar, and bass sessions, you've also been called on over the years to do some uh, mallet uh, per percussion work, which I believe is, is quite special to you. Tell us about some of the sessions you've done there. Well, uh, percussion-wise, uh, my what I do the best is mallet percussion which is vibraphone marimba orchestra bells that kind of thing you know like a piano with sticks <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, uh the, i guess one of the biggest records i played there was a record uh in the uh, early 70s by bobby vinton called blue velvet mm -hmm. it was a huge hit in this country and i did vibes and orchestra bells on that song and that's probably the biggest one that I played on. Uh, oh, I also played vibes on uh, on uh, Rose Garden by Lynn Anderson. That was ah, a yes. big, big hit here. Uh, so I've done a lot of vibes, not much marimba, uh, and uh, you know, and I'm I'm not really a, like a Congo player or anything. Like I can, you know, I can hit a few licks, but it's not really my specialty. If I'm doing percussion, you know. <laughs> tambourine or cowbell something like that but yeah my specialty is those those uh those uh percussion instruments that have keys <laughs> what um what standout changes have, have you noticed in recording procedures over the years for a typical day's work for a session player has it changed much for you it's changed a lot and what what's changed it the most is the technology you know uh and sometimes i think the further forward we go, the further behind we get. And I'm speaking, uh, its that's a cliche, meaning that we can make records perfect, but we don't make them any better. Mm. The, the old records that were made, like the Brenda Lee, the Patsy Cline, the Everly Brothers, the early Orbison, those records, they were all done together, all at once, musicians, background singers, and even strings on some of the Brendan Lee. They were all in the studio together, and the engineer captured a performance. And I'm afraid that in nowadays, they pretty much go to the studio to create a performance. And yeah. to me, that, although like I said, we have the technology, you can even put an S on a word now, you know. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, I liked it when the singer knew the song and could sing it. You know, we didn't tune the vocals. Yeah. Uh, everybody was there, and we all fed off of each other. And it was so it was so neat to have the artist there delivering that song. And you know, it, I, I think it was a special feeling that these guys today, unfortunately, uh, they miss out on that. Yeah, you've captured it beautifully. It was it was like it was capturing a moment in time back then, but now it's more clinically put together. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm, I, the musicians, like I say, most of the A-team guys are a friend of mine, the guys that are doing it today, and they wish 
they could do it the old way. Yeah. But it's it the whole thing has changed now, and uh, with the technology, uh, I don't, you know, I mean, every once in a while you'll hear about somebody doing a, a session the old way, but for the most part, no, it's not done that way anymore. I guess being a studio musician, it could be uh, something of a, an, an anonymous uh, existence at times. You don't get the recognition of, of the artist that you're backing. Does it take a, a special type of person to be able to, to devote a career to that? Well, I think so. Uh, it's people that don't care about the limelight and people that are <laughs> tired of traveling. Uh, that That's a lot of it. Uh, but there's something really special in being in that creative process, you know, that Especially if you make if you make some landmark recordings that that seem to last forever, that that is that's really special, uh, you know. And that the key to Nashville success is that studio musicians. We have a saying here: check your ego at the door. <laughs> you know, uh, the song and the singer is the picture; we're the frame. You know, uh, and that, that that's always been the way it's done here and it, it's proven to be successful. Is there one golden rule that uh, you've always taken with you in, into the studio when going in for a session? Something you always yes. make? Yes, there is. And I and I got this from the A-Team guys. You know, when I speak of the A-Team guys, you know who I mean. Uh, Floyd Kramer, Bob oh. Moore, Buddy Harmon, Grady Martin, Harold Bradley, you know, that. the guys that yeah. were doing it when I came here. Yeah. But, uh, yes, my... The the rule I live by is that for this three hours, whoever this artist is, it doesn't matter if he's a huge star or if he's, uh, we, uh, we have the saying sometimes, text nobody. That guy is as important as Elvis or Dylan or anybody else for those three hours. And to me, that's the secret of Nashville recording because uh, everybody pretty much feels that way yeah and that so uh, you know i if when i'm dead and gone what i would like to be said about me was that he gave a hundred percent at every session you were um, musical director of the the television series he haw for for many years and i guess that would have been at a peak time in your uh, your studio career as well was it difficult at the time balancing the two it was it, the, the most difficult thing was making the decision you know, they called me to work on the show, and and I knew they did. They would do 13 shows in a month, and I had visions of having to be there all month, you know. But then they called me in, and we had a chat about it, and they said, well, look, you know, the band's only here maybe 10 or 12 days out of the month because a lot of days they do only comedy, and, and they, don't, they don't have musicians around when they do that. So I decided to try it, and... I did miss a few sessions, but there was so much, it was so special to be with, you're talking about legends, man, we were surrounded by <laughs> legends, uh, you know, Roy Clark, Buck Owens, uh, Grandpa Jones, Roy Acuff, Minnie Pearl, I mean, we were surrounded by, and it was such a camaraderie on that show, and I realized that this show was really doing some big things for country music nationwide, because all... You know, it, they syndicated this show, and it was like it was like all over America. Yeah, and uh, it stayed that way for years and years. And uh, so I I would try it for a season, and thought, well, that didn't work out too bad. I'll try it one more. <laughs> you know, and 18 years later, when the show went off the air, I was still there. <laughs> Looking back over the over the session work you've done over the years, is there any one particular artist that you haven't worked with that you really wish you could have there's a couple right now that people that are kind of you know in the mainstream I, I would like to work with martina mcbride alan jackson brad paisley and maybe uh you know of the of the pop acts maybe uh oh cheryl crow <laughs> diana crawl yeah you know, but i don't I don't think I would ever get that opportunity. You know, I'm I'm certainly not a jazz player, nor am I considered to be one. You were recently inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. That must have uh, been a special moment for you. What kind? Of, what does that type of recognition mean mean to you? Well, 
you know, it was something I never ever thought about my whole career because I, I just assumed it was not possible. But then uh, a few years ago, they changed their uh, criteria down there, and they decided that every third year they would induct a studio musician. And when that came around, I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe it's possible. But I never, I never really thought about it. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the the first one inducted was Floyd Kramer. Mm -hmm. Three years later was Harold Bradley, and uh, I was in the top five those both of those times. But I still, you know, I, I I didn't let myself dwell on it. And then when I got that call in February of 2009, <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather, I'm <laughs> telling you. And it was really special, uh, you know, to be... You know, I, that morning I went up for the press release. Uh, I walked around the, the hall up there and uh, looked at the plaques in there, and I had played with 53 of them. Wow. Of the people that were in the Hall of Fame. And now there's been... Uh, you know, two more, two more years of people since, and I have now played with sixty of them. <laughs> yeah, goodness. And that, me. It, so what I was what I was trying to get at was, all I ever wanted to do was play with these people, mm. and to be recognized with them in that place is just it's so special. It's it's hard to describe. Yeah, and thoroughly deserved too. Um, talking about your, your own music these days, are you, are you performing live uh, uh, much? Well, not a lot. I do about 30 dates a year. Yeah. Uh, I, I go to Europe every year. I, I found a couple of places that really like what I do. Uh, I play a lot in France, and I used to play a lot in Scandinavia. My agent passed away there. I've been playing over the past five or six years in the Czech Republic. Wow, and it goes great there, and uh, so, and I've you know I've already been contacted about three dates next June in France again. So, yeah, you know I I love to play over there. That people over there don't care how old you are. <laughs> you know, in this country, in this country, there's a lot of age discrimination sometimes, yeah. Yeah. and people want to pigeonhole you. You know, they want to put you in a in a box, and they want you to be there and and in Europe, they don't have any expectations like that. It's just like, oh, can he play? Well, great. Let's go hear him. <laughs> I believe Japan was a, a regular stopping point for you, too, for a while. Yes, I, I've been to Japan 20 years, and uh, I, I, I ran into a, a guy over there who, who's a, he's a country music singer, and he puts on these festivals every year. And uh, So I, I went for 10 straight years. I took a year off. I went for 10 more years, and I took this year off. And uh, this festival's kind of in trouble now. The economy over there is in bad shape, so, you know, chances are there won't be any more. I, do, I don't know, but if there are, well, then I'll have to, uh, you know, because they ask me every year in addition to another artist. And uh, so I'll have to make that decision when the, if and when the call comes. Yeah. So, Charlie, after all these years, are you still learning from your instruments, like particularly the harmonica? Is that an instrument you can still be learning about after all these years of playing it? Absolutely. I, I learned something. I learned something almost every time I pick it up. <laughs> and I tell you what, uh, I am, uh, I, I'm, I am still enthused about it. I, I just released uh, album number thirty-seven, which was a Hank Williams tribute. And uh, I have uh, I have all these projects in my head, you know, for the future. I just need to find somebody to pay for them. <laughs> so just before I let you go, what what is in the immediate future? Are, are there any projects that are just about ready to go? Uh, well, no. Uh, we just released the Hank Williams, and so I, I, I've actually uh, uh, in 1993 I went over to Ireland and made an instruction video for a British company called Music Sales. And, uh, well, time passed and, you know, videos went out of style. And so they took the, the, they took the uh, videos off the market. And so I have recently uh, uh, made a negotiation with them to uh, bring it back out on DVD 
in this country, and so I will be uh, selling this uh, instruction DVD now myself on my website and at my concerts. Uh, it should. They tell me it will be shipping to me uh, November the seventh. So, oh, and I don't have anything booked until December. So that's fine. Fantastic. Charlie, thank you so much for, for giving us your time today and thank you, most importantly, for your major contribution to, to so much music that we've loved over the years. Well, John, I, thank you. I enjoyed it. And uh, if you get to Nashville, give me a shout. I will do. I, I, you can count on that. Thank you so much, Charlie. Okay, bye. All, all the best. Bye.